<laughs> just like, <laughs> cool. Microphones, we haven't used these in a long time in this way. It's awesome to see everyone back. Welcome to a lot of our new students. We have an awesome series of lectures coming up throughout the quarter. I will be your MC and moderator for 10 weeks. We're going to have, I think, seven lectures. This is our first one. It feels really good to be back. We have a new director. We have a new building. We have new students. It feels awesome. Firstly, I would like to say that I'm Caleb Fox. I'm an assistant professor here at UCSD. My primary focus is genome technologies, and this has been my partner in crime for a very long time. So it is incredible to, to bring her here. But first, I wanted to give this to our new director. Welcome to San Diego. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. And then this goes to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. So, now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Crystal Tosi is coming to us from, I guess it's Arizona State, where you recently accepted a professorship. She is a proud Diné woman. She is the founder of the Native Biodata Consortia. You may have seen her work recently in the cover of the science section of the New York Times newspaper or many, many other outlets, including, oh boy, what, I might mess this up, but, oh, what, Ted, Atlantic, all kinds of things. Um, it's so many, I mean, I lost track of how many times she's published in Nature, and she's just starting her job, she's just getting started. So I knew that it was really important for us to bring in a totally different vibe and a totally different range of speakers for this design at large. So historically, I think the way people have thought about design may have been, I don't know, Steve Jobs playing with the iPhone or, you know, people thinking about architecture in certain ways, but we're gonna have a totally different way that we think about design for the next 10 weeks. And this is your first speaker, so give her a round of applause. A real one, not that fake Zoom stuff. Much better? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Right, good this is uh, the great part about being the first of anything is that you get to also be the test fry bread, which, which is test pancake, but in Diné culture, the fry bread. If you haven't had fry bread, it's amazing. Just um, make sure you have the honey and the powdered sugar ready to go. So, yet everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this amazing speaker series. And, you know, as Kiela mentioned, this is just, I'm so proud to talk about the Data Biodata Consortium because when I embarked on my journey as a scientist, I did not envision that it would also tack on the title of entrepreneur as well. And I think this is important because when we're talking about being scholars of color and innovating in the space of precision medicine and omics and genomics, which is generally my field, then we really have to talk about how do we innovate and push the boundaries, not just in academia, but beyond academia. So this is my honor to talk to you today about how we can re-indigenize genomics and data science. And that re-indigenize is important because indigenous peoples have always been scientists and we have always been data statisticians in some form or another. So really what we're doing is we're reclaiming our indigenous voices in these spaces that have for so long neglected to include us. As Dr. Fox so kindly mentioned, I am completing my degree at Vanderbilt University. And this is a great institution for training. But Tennessee forcibly removed all of its tribes further west. So if I wanted to do a, a research study related to community engagement in tribes, I couldn't do it in Tennessee. No, I had to go further north. I had to go to North Dakota and South Dakota. And by north, I mean negative 50 degrees in the winter when I landed. And now I'm from Phoenix. I'm a desert denizen. I'm used to 118 degrees in the summer. 
So, whew, people thought I wasn't going to last very long. I showed them. But this is amazing because um, in North Dakota, driving long distances is really nothing. So I was able to collaborate with another organization, or our organization, the Native Biodata Consortium, in the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe in South Dakota. And that brings me to ASU, which I'll be gladly starting my assistant professorship soon. I want to start here because it's unfortunately a trope that ties these two facts together. The first being that across any health outcome, Native Americans suffer worse health outcomes than the dominant population. And that fact is typically coupled with this statistic, that despite efforts to increase inclusion and diversity in research, that indigenous people continue to constitute less than 1% of genetic study participants. So how can we talk about translating the next innovations in precision health and omics if we're not even including those that are most disadvantaged? So what I want to talk about is not framing this in a deficit mindset, but turning it around into a mindset of empowerment to state that if we want to bridge these gaps in health and genetic equity, then that means we need to empower indigenous peoples to lead the research for themselves. There are so many reasons why indigenous peoples don't engage in research. This is just a few of them, just categorized broadly across cultural and political spectrums. But as the center of it all is a history of distrust. I'm not talking about decades of history. I'm talking just in the last two decades alone, and even in continued bioethical controversies that continue to persist in research in our communities, such that when we're talking about what it means to ameliorate health disparities in indigenous communities, we should never frame this as, how do we get tribes comfortable with genetics research? Because that framing can be coercive and misleading. Instead, the question should be, how do we protect tribes if they want to engage in research and genetics? And that if is really important because it's conditional upon whether or not tribes want to partake in their research. And that's not something that we can force for them. Trust building takes time. Trust building requires repairing relationships that have been lost in the past. So we really have to think more about what can we do for tribes if they want to work with us? I, as a population geneticist, I really have to stop and really critique the field of genetics, particularly racial genetics. Because I think too often what we do is when we think about health inequities, we over biologicize how much of these factors are actually related due to genetic factors and genetic predeterminants. But let's take a step back and consider COVID. So the re current pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on communities like my own, like the Diné community. And those differences are not due to biological factors relating to uh, infectious disease rates. It's due to structural barriers. When community members have to drive hours one way to get to a preventative health clinic, then we really have to stop and think about what are the structural barriers entailed in health inequities. Let's consider 2018, the spending for, by the Indian Health Services was $3,800 per patient, compared to $9,400 per person um, across uh, spend, national spending for that same year. Maybe this has more to do with health inequities than genetic determinants. Let's also consider this. Indigenous people have disengaged from genomic research due to historic harms. Now, if we continually tell them that they're going to miss out on precision benefits if they don't partake in the research, what are we really doing? We're victim blaming here. We're engaging in a cycle of coercion unless we give indigenous peoples a means for empowering the research on their own terms. This is really important. And I really want to highlight this point. If you're going to come away with anything from this talk, what I hope you really come from 
uh, come away with is this. Inclusion is something that we have always claimed to do when we want to diversify our data sets. And that's something that has led to commercialization and extraction of our genomes and commodification of our indigenous genomes with uh, direct-to-consumer ancestry tests like 23andMe and Ancestry. Inclusion is not what we should be aiming for here because that's always been the goal. What we really should be aiming for is equity and equity in decision making. And if that means innovating on our own terms and our own communities, then that's what we need to do. Which is why I'm really proud to center the rest of this talk on the Native Biodata Consortium. So the NBDC is actually the first indigenous-led biological data repository within tribal jurisdictions in the US. It is now a 501c3 nonprofit organized under both tribal and federal law. Board members are from the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe and also comprise of indigenous scientists. So we are so fortunate that this is probably the first point in history in which we have had a bolus, a, a great wealth of indigenous scientists who have been trained at this point in time that we can actually leverage that talent to be part of our board members and our board advisors as well. And ev even though we have founded and incorporated in 2018, we've actually are utilizing research partnerships that have started in the community since before 2009. But imagine this, even if we didn't exist on paper as an organization since 2018, in the last two to three years, we have published so many works. We have went from an operating budget of zero dollars to now I think over five and a half million in the past year. And we're gonna continue to grow, this is amazing. This is so great because not only are we talking about increasing precision health and bringing state-of-the-art technologies to communities, but we're also talking about what it means to increase data sovereignties and increase data sharing policies that lead to a sustainable future for indigenous peoples. And we're doing it with community engagement. It's really amazing that our organization brought the first next-gen sequencers to a tribal community, and that's thanks to Illumina. And with this, and I'll talk about projects later, but we really are opening the doors for a genetic revolution in these communities. When I talk about indigenous genomic data sovereignty, I'm talking about the right of indigenous nations and peoples to exercise autonomies to protect their interests related to genomic data and research. Just as a quick timeline, as I mentioned in 2019, 2009, what we really started doing was we took over research from other organizations whose reputations were based on recruiting in communities. So these were largely non-indigenous researchers who were coming into our communities and just recruiting native people to, for studies that probably didn't benefit them. And we saw that there was a problem here. We saw that if we wanted to make research equitable and beneficial, more proximally, we had to ensure that indigenous peoples were at the front of all of these decisions. So with that, we were able to start with a pilot fund from Stanford University. And then we started really starting these discussions at the community level. This is really important because if we wanna talk about a community-based entrepreneur um, organization, we had to talk about starting from the community itself. And this is where I think research does it backwards. I think researchers first come into a community with a research goal and intent already laid out. And they expect community board members to just hop on board with the researchers' visions. We approach this from the other way around, that we had to start with the community members first and then build from the ground up if we want to ensure that this organization, the research aims to actually benefit them. And then, you know, lately we've had just a lot of knowledge and learning related to what it means to be a scientist slash entrepreneur. And that has been amazing and great and fun. Just in terms of our facilities, our facilities are humble, but they're also the first to exist in a tribal, remote tribal community such as this one. We have lab space and uh, office space, 
And um, it's really awesome that we actually have uh, apartments on the lower level because this is a rural community in central South Dakota. The next nearest town is large city is about three hours or four hours away. What we envision is actually providing a space for scientists to come work in the communities and actually learn how, what tribal policy entails and what this type of work means. This is type of training that normally doesn't come to us for most standard graduate students. This is something that is really unique. We also envision this as an opportunity for indigenous peoples and other scholars who may or may not feel like academia is the place for them, that they want to try their feet in policy or ethics or business, to provide them a means, a transition point of gaining that skill set while also contributing back to the community. So just enabling having that housing space in the middle of you know, having it secured is just great. And just imagine this, when it's negative 30 degrees in South Dakota, your commute is from upstairs to downstairs. The bare minimum for a biobank is honestly just a set of freezers. And we could have stopped there, but we didn't. Because we want to make sure that the research and data was useful to the communities. So we have really continually expand our lab space, and we continue to do so. And with sponsors, we are now able to start groundbreaking um, our new laboratory space next year, next spring, which is unfathomable that, again, a bunch of scientists were, or were that we're even doing this, which is such, so amazing. Um, you know, our board structure is such that we have our board of advisors, but we also have a community advisory group whose advice and decision-making authorities is equal to that of the board or even beyond that. Uh, what is really important is that we have a community advisory group that comprises, is comprised of the members that represent those um, individuals that are part of our da data sets. And they meet at least quarterly. That we're trying to make sure that they're an independent entity and self-funded so that their decisions are completely their own that their decisions are not biased by our continued um, funding to them. And this is also just a great means of educating the community as well. And also giving good, um, earning good favor, or earning good, learning good feedback for tribal politicians so that they understand why we exist and then that we're not just there on their lands to take their data and, and go away to sell their data to something like 23andMe and Ancestry. It's really important that we have the trust of community members, which is why this is so important. So when we're talking about data governance, the first and major key question is who owns or who governs that data? And everything else related to data governance follows from that question related to security, accessibility, and all those other questions, first starts with who owns or who stores that data. So it's really important for us to engage community members to ask them, how should data that comes from your peoples be stewarded? And how can we help, if at all? So with this, we work with Stanford University and Oklahoma, or yeah, Oklahoma University, and we did a lot of qualitative research. And this is really almost novel in the space of biological research. It's interesting that community-based participatory research, CBPR, is something that we talk a lot about in, in human biology and biological sciences and biomedical sciences, but that's a recent innovation in those fields. But in actuality, CBPR has existed in environmental justice and social science research for decades, since the 70s. And so, similarly with qualitative research, bringing that into what has historically been quantitative research in population genetics is also really innovative and new. And we've been able to do these types of techniques in order to start with a very strong ethical and cultural groundwork. 
so that we can ensure that whatever work we do with the community is something that is that they permit. And in asking them, you know, how should ownership or stewardship, how does this look for you, for you as community members? We actually came with a spectrum of models. So the first model all the way to the, the left is a null model, which a tribe just doesn't have to engage in research. And all the way in the right is tribally driven research, TDR, which is a phrase coined by Dr. Eddie Brown at ASU in the late 90s. And this is largely a theoretical framework at this point. But you can see that as we move from left to right, we're going to get to a point in which a tribe retains control and responsibility all over, over all aspects of data. And in the middle is kind of where we are right now, in which we have tribal trust relationships or non-tribal partnerships, in which tribes actually have to rely on non-Indigenous partners in order to steward and make these decisions for them. And you can imagine that sometimes that for us doesn't necessarily translate to benefits for us. So we have to make sure that those that are making the data decisions are actually representing the will and the interests of the communities itself. So we ask the community members during deliberations, which is like a town hall meeting and also in focus groups, what do you envision as an ideal model for yourselves? And it's really interesting, well, maybe not interesting, or um, maybe not uh, new if you don't live in tribal communities, but picture this. Indigenous communities, some of them are so small that our tribal leaders and government leaders are our cousins. These are our people that we grew up with. Now, imagine that we're telling your cousin that you grew up with here are the keys to all my confidential information and all my genetic information. Is that something you really trust your cousin to do? I mean, consider the Golden State Killer. I mean, he was, um, he was found out because of a random third cousin who deposited his uh, genetic information into, uh, into a third party website. Someone he didn't even know. So, I mean, I love my cousins, but I wouldn't trust them in the same aspect as with giving them the keys to all my biological and sensitive information. And it turns out that the community members in Shine River felt the same way. And what they actually stated is that they trusted indigenous scientists who were outside of the community to help steward these things for themselves. Indigenous scientists that had the training, something, uh, a, an organization that was outside the budgets of their tribal organizations, because tribal organizations are already so um, full of other commitments, like paying for things like water and education. We were about to create an entity from scratch and then state, okay, now it's up to you to, to manage this because not a lot of tribal communities at this point in time have the local expertise to be able to maintain those infrastructures. So having a, something in the middle in which we have a means in which the tribe still maintains ownership and stewardship of the data, but the day-to-day -day questions of how to maintain that organization has led to the hands of indigenous scientists is something that actually the community members felt like they were more comfortable with, hence the NBDC. Now, it's also interesting too, when we were talking with community members, what they understood was that any federally funded science that occurs in the US, any data that generates is generated from those studies has to be deposited in a database that they don't have any control over. And they wanted that to change. And that's actually what MBDC does, is it offers an alternative so that tribes could engage in research if they wanted to, but ensure that those, that data is held locally. And if they had this alternative, it turns out that more tribal nations felt comfortable with engaging in research, which is ultimately the goal that we want to ensure that genomic data from communities ultimately benefits them. And the other great thing is that we also build local STEM economies. What happens is a brain drain in which 
indigenous students get trained in universities that are outside of their homelands. And then if they can't find jobs in science and technology and data science, where do they go? Or actually the question is, do they come back or not? And more often times, if they cannot find a job within their own homelands, they probably won't come back. But if we can build economies locally related to data science and, and, and science and other forms of technology, then we can ensure that we're building economies that are from the ground up that ensures that the data and the money stays locally owned by tribes. So some other projects that we are working on are a COVID public health surveillance program, a, um, some ongoing research related to rheumatoid arthritis. And this is really interesting because any specific variants that are indigenous, we want to ensure that any intellectual property that could be created is retained by the tribe. And this entails creating equitable data use agreements, and it's a lot of legal um, expertise and knowledge that we are leveraging with tribal lawyers so that if a tribe wants to maintain IP and they're going head to head with a major university, that they're not gonna be fundamentally, um, uh, um, they're not gonna be demunitized when they come to, to, the, to the table to try to make those decisions. We're also wanting to ensure that the return and repatriation of indigenous data uh, related to ancient samples and our ancestors is done well too. For instance, there are unknown numbers of DNA that have been collected before tribal nations have their own IRBs or RRBs or research regulatory boards. And, you know, these are samples that are just languishing in non-Indigenous scientists' freezers. And we want to provide an alternative to scientists to return those samples back to Indigenous communities rather than selling them to something like family tree DNA. And that brings me back to my last point of my presentation, which is increasing representation of Indigenous students in data science. This was mentioned briefly by Dr. Fox, but one of our ma main goals is to not just build STEM economies, but also STEM education so that we can contribute to that capacity building in our communities. So we really want to, to we came with this goal over a year ago about how we can use our nonprofit status to create data boot camps. And what we found, unfortunately, looking at statistics, is that natives are severely underrepresented in STEM fields, receiving less than 1% of all bachelor degrees and all doctorates. So there's a huge need for informatics education training for tribal students. So as Dr. Fox always says, that data is commensurate with a new economy of scale. Data is the new oil. You may have heard him say time and time again. And if you haven't, you'll hear him say it time and time again. <laughs> now, if data is the new commodity, and that's where the money is being driven, then why aren't we training more scholars of color who represent the communities that are being mined for that data? And that's our central goal, is that we want to increase the training of students in informatics and data science. Since our organization is geographically proximal to 13 of the 35 TCUs, we wanted to make sure that we extended opportunities to tribal college and university students, especially since they have such a good, such a good um, track record in ensuring that these types of uh, education programs are also culturally congruent. Hence, we came up with Indigidata, which is a one week this first year a virtual workshop for training indigenous students in data science and informatics and also in data ethics. And it was so great that we were also able to leverage our networks of indigenous data scientists who have, again, we haven't had this, this huge number of indigenous data scientists in any point in history except for now. So we're really seizing the moment while we can take it. And in addition to just try, uh, providing the training, what we're really doing is strengthening existing and new partnerships and building trust 
circling back to the beginning part of this conversation. If we want to build trust, another way that we can do this in a sustainable way is to train those that come from our communities and also extend those mentorship opportunities to also include internship opportunities and also the training. In any of these aspects related to data ethics, data analysis, and just command line programming, we really implemented an indigenous component to it. What's a way that we can do this better in a way that's culturally congruent with how students think? And how can we ensure that the next workforce of indigenous peoples think of these things in a critical way that they can benefit their communities again? This means thinking about data ethics in an indigenous way, thinking not just about their principles, but also about care principles, about community benefit and action and responsibility and ethics. And to do this, we work with a lot of partners. We work with the US Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network, Carpentries, Cubes, and Neon. But really what our aim is to do is to center indigenous scientists and students at this whole process through mentorship and through training. And as Dr. Fox mentioned, we have had such great success with this program that we were able to have the New York Times come and feature us. And this won't be the first feature. I mean, next year, it, depending on the conditions of the pandemic, we hope to do this for the first time at our biobank to bring in a cohort of students and indigenous leaders and uh, um, elders to come in the same space and learn together. And that's just amazing and impressive. In addition, if you haven't heard about the Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples in Genomics or SING, which is a consortium related to talking about indigenous genetics and ethics, we, we want to do is expand, not just beyond the US and Canada and Australia and Aotearoa New Zealand, but we also want to create SING Mexico which we hope to start next year. And this is MBDC now that just started three years ago on paper is now leading, I hope to say co-leading, the training of indigenous students in these so many new exciting avenues. I want to leave with a, a final message. If we want to reconcile the widening disparity between practicing science upon indigenous peoples, that we need to transform science with us. Indigenous peoples can no longer be passive participants in science. We wish to elevate attention to indigenous data sovereignties commensurate with the field's exploitation of our genomes. And then, and ultimately, indigenous peoples should have sovereignty over our data. One final nugget. There's a lot of rhetoric going around related to racial equity and ethics and justice. Think about this. The lowest hanging fruit has already been picked. Our knowledge of common variants related to common disease and variants related to Mendelian disorders, a lot of those have already been discovered and studied and have been published over time and time again. If we want to talk about where the next innovation is in science, it's going to be in rare variants that come from communities like ours that are small and identifiable. So if we really want to talk about data equity and equity and innovation, then we need to ensure that the next ad advancement in medicine is done by us and empowered by us. So yeah, thank you so much. It has been my honor to talk to you, and I guess we're doing Q&A.